Oh gosh, whoa! I find when I don't have a good intro, I resort to gymnastics. <laughs> yep, that's me. Hello, beautiful bookish people. My name is Hannah, and today we're doing a very exciting reading vlog, at least in my opinion. We're rereading the Percy Jackson series. And this is really special because I just turned 23. I feel really old, so I don't want to talk about it. But when I was 13 is when I first started reading these books. And so what we're going to do is reread the series 10 years later. And what I've uh, come to find out on my channel is I don't talk about Percy Jackson enough. This was a fundamental series in my life. Why don't I talk about it? I don't know. But we're rectifying it today. The <laughs> thing that got me into reading was the Percy Jackson books. So I'm very excited to look at it with an adult lens or an older lens to see what I notice, what I take away. So, yeah. Um, I'll come along, see what 23-year-old Hannah thinks of Percy Jackson. Alright, I'm tired of saying how old I am, so let's get going. Okay, I'm only one chapter in, but I just want to say, the first chapter is so iconic. How does it, like, set up a character of Percy Jackson with intrigue with that letter of, like, stop reading this book if you think you relate to this. Sets up secondary characters, Riptide, while also giving you action. And a Greek mythology lesson. Like, the moral of the story is, don't eat mustard and wine, otherwise you might throw up your kids that will then eventually overthrow you. Greek mythology. I don't know why I'm soft at the fact that Sally, Percy's mom, is a novelist. <laughs> like, stop! That's so sweet! This video is gonna be filled with spoilers. Because <laughs> we're gonna talk about all the details about who's gonna die. So if you don't want that, um, see you later. But also, read Percy Jackson. Guys, this is so much fun. I'm so happy I'm doing this. Okay, bye. Hello! Welcome to Updates with Hannah with a cane. Um, I don't know why I have a cane. I just found it in my room. But, in a reading vlog, where we are reading a book series ten years later, it seems fitting. <laughs> I don't know why I'm inclined to feel the need to give you a summary, but it's about a kid named Percy Jackson who's the son of Poseidon, and he must go on a quest to find the lightning bolt, otherwise a mass war will happen. So now let's talk about more important details, like the first interaction between Percy and Annabeth. Is Percy describing Annabeth's hair as a princess-like? Aww. Are you kidding? That is so incredibly sweet. Um, and also, I don't think we talk about enough how, like, Percy Jackson probably needs to go to therapy because he literally witnessed his mother die in front of him from the Minotaur. And he's only 12. He's literally only 12. I want to quickly talk about Dionysus because when I was a kid, I did not understand why he was so grumpy. But honestly, as a 23-year-old, I get it. Imagine being punished and your punishment is you're not allowed to do the one thing you're good at, which is drink and party. So you have to drink Diet Coke all the time. I would be pissed too. You know what, Dionysus? I think you're valid. Um, but maybe you can be nicer to Peter Johnson. Thank you. You you know what I miss from Percy Jackson, what's making me realize, is I miss chapter titles. Not like chapter one, chapter two, but like, we took a zebra to Las Vegas, and I miss that. Authors... I think we need to bring that back, and I think that's a decision and a conversation we need to have. Alright, I just finished The Lightning Thief. I did fully intend to savor it, but I finished it within a good five hours. <laughs> and I think that's testament to Rick's writing and his ability to captivate you. The groundwork of this book is in impeccable. It sets you up with Kronos in the first chapter. It gives you the character of Ares and how he's the actual stealer of the lightning bolt. And it also gives you the foreshadowing in a dream form of Luke portraying Percy. Which I think is commendable work because he gives you everything. Gosh dang, this is a good book y'all. Um, 13 year old me had taste. I'm very excited to go on to book two. Alright, I'm gonna get back to reading. Bye. Hi. Welcome to Updates of Hannah with a cane because we're keeping with the theme of being old. So we're on to the Sea of Monsters and right from the beginning my girl Annabeth 
is saving Percy while he is simultaneously in a tie-dye shirt. Name a more iconic couple. I'll wait. That's right, you can! Like, growing up, I always used to think I was Annabeth Chase, but now I just think I'm Dionysus. <laughs> you know, like, jaded, in a Hawaiian shirt, you know, actually, this wasn't planned, but I'm literally drinking a Diet Coke right now. Should we get a Hawaiian shirt on? In three, two, one. My closet is filled with Hawaiian shirts. And now I understand Dionysus way more about being jaded and complaining about your current situation. That's me this entire semester. So, Dionysus, maybe I am you. <laughs> And, um, sorry to come back so quickly, I think another reason, like, Percy, why Percy Jackson is so lovable is that Rick Riordan doesn't give you a choice but to love him. The way that Percy treats Tyson in this book and the character development of, like, already, like, being super honorable and a nice guy to him, then, at the end, just accepting him as a brother, that's why we fell in love with him. <laughs> Actually, I want to share with you something from my childhood. <laughs> I always used to be suspicious of chain restaurants and literally now I know the origin because some of the chains multiply so fast because all of their locations are magically linked to the life force of a monster and that's why we don't go to McDonald's. Okay, we're back and we finished it. <laughs> we just so fast but they're so good! And I think I've come to the conclusion why this series is so good is there's no middle book syndrome. Every book is important. And even though Sea of Monsters is not the favorite of everybody's, it's still important and it adds things to the grander plot. And by the end of it, even though we only have to get this one thing, aka the fleece, by the end of the day you feel like it was a pawn in a grander story, but it's still important that we have it. I hope I'm making sense, because even though we got the thing, aka the fleece, there's still repercussions for it, aka Thalia coming back. Rick Riordan's mind, guys. Another day, another Hawaiian shirt. Am I right? Alright, so we've started the Titan's Curse, but I really quickly want to show you, look at my signature. Oh, and I finished it in 2010. Isn't that wholesome? <laughs> I think so. So as we recall, in the beginning, Percy, Thalia, and Annabeth are going on a mission to try to save two powerful half-bloods, who happen to be, they don't know yet, the son of Hades. Um, and then Annabeth gets captured, and campers and hunters of Artemis have to join together to save her. And I think what also is, like, the series does really well is, like, once you know about Greek mythology, it is literally everywhere. Like, I went on a drive today and I literally saw a hotel called Athena. Wow. Was that a sign? Was that serendipity? Yes, because Annabeth is missing, y'all! Alright, we did it, y'all. The Titan's Curse is complete. I just really want to continue my Dionysus reputation, so we got another Diet Coke. <laughs> And I think I can tell you why the Titan's Curse was 100% my favorite. Because now I'm self-actualized and understand what I like in books. And it's 100% the yearning. <laughs> the amount of times Percy is just like, yeah, I don't care about the monsters. I just want to save Annabeth. I can get your heart beat, 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 beating like, I can get your heart beat, beating like that. If you guys know where that reference is from, I'm your best friend right now. Let's go. I also like how the gods suffer from bureaucracy <laughs> and bureaucratic actions because they literally have to take a vote if they want to sacrifice Bessie and or punish the demigods for doing literally their job. And you're like, okay, now I understand you, Luke, where you're coming from. If we had had maybe a little more scenes with just the gods debating the mortality and ethics of the demigods, 100%. Little... 13 year old me would have been like, oh, okay, I understand you, Luke. This is BS. But I'm really excited for the Battle of the Labyrinth. I think that was my second favorite. So much stuff happens in that one, but I can't tell you literally anything. So I'm just gonna go back to reading. Bye. All right, we have officially started the Battle of the Labyrinth. And right off the bat, you know, I forgot how iconic Rachel is. 
I love her ability to just call out Percy on monsters and character flaws, but seemingly in a loving way, I respect her so much. I love the way the labyrinth is described. It's like called a patchwork of ever expanding parts like it's forever expanding which is like brilliant because it allows you to like think whatever you think the maze is like but also terrifying because it allows you to think whatever the maze is like but I will get back to you in a hot second right so um we've actually just completed the battle of the labyrinth but this is the same spot as I think I was last time so should we find like a different spot maybe we should find a bookish spot huh welcome to the middle grade shelf this was not planned but that's perfect I think what's really cool about this rendition of the Percy Jackson series is it really delves deep into mythology. Like, typically for for other books in the series, it's kind of like modernized a lot of aspects of mythology of like, Hermes invented the internet, Aphrodite and Ares, they meet at a carnival at the Tunnel of Love, but this one is like, no, this is mythology. We're talking about the labyrinth. We're talking about the Sphinx. Also, I just love these characters. But I love how you can tell each and every person's motivation from just Percy's perspective. Like, you know Grover is on the search for Pam. You know Percy always has the prophecy in the back of his mind, even though he doesn't know it yet. I don't remember he doesn't get to know the prophecy until the last book. That's insane to me. Like, you know all these characters' fatal flaws. You know Annabeth wants her parents to get together and her fatal flaw is hubris. And, like, Nico... Oh, Nico. I think why I don't remember a lot of the story is because just like so much happens in this book regarding Percy, Nico, and even Rachel. She's so instrumental. Like she can see through the mist and therefore can tell us where to go in the maze. And I love Calypso. Calypso is a nuanced queen. We find out that she was cursed just because she was a titan's daughter and she kind of like has these conversations with percy hey not all gods are good and not all titans are bad she would be a swing vote wouldn't she it's so good getting onto the last book i'm kind of emotional i don't know how i'm gonna feel i remember liking it but i re remember literally nothing about it so i think it's time to get going all right we finished it um i don't think you guys knew this but it took me two weeks to um finish this entire series which i'm i'm glad it did because it, i was just able to savor like every moment and like and re-examine why i loved them as a middle schooler a teenager and even now it's very validating to know that the series you were raised on is like the good kush you know because what i think the last olympian does really well is examining understanding your enemy and not just understanding but empathizing and understanding where they're coming from because there's so much luke backstory in the last olympian understanding why hermes couldn't tell him about his future understanding his mom and how annabeth and thalia played a part in his history and so you really get to see how that affects Percy and understanding how there is mistreatment of like the minor gods or Hades in Mount Olympus or the representation in Camp Half-Blood. I don't know how to explain to you how good Percy Jackson is if you haven't picked it up. Not to be rude but I'm so sorry. <laughs> They're so thorough and thoughtful and yet fun, captivating, and entertaining. They have like the perfect balance. They're a Libra. There we are. <coughs> I guess it feels really special to reread them 10 years later and still think they're great. <laughs> I mean, these were my first like book loves. These are the reason I'm a reader. I probably wouldn't be talking to you if these if these books didn't exist, which is like a hard thing to think about, but um let's not think about it too much. And um but I think that's all I have to say is Percy Jackson is one of the loves of my life and he's the reason I'm a reader. So, not to get too sappy, but I love you guys. I love Percy, and thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time. Keep reading and all that jazz. Much. 
that is too much for my little heart. My little purse of Beth's shipping heart. Like, I don't know if this is a U.S. thing, but I couldn't go through middle school without playing dodgeball. By the way, I was good at it. You have married an Icarus, and he has flown too close to the sun. Everybody needs an environmentalist friend like Grover. But Rick Roy does what? Oh my gosh. Out into the unknown. Isn't that wholesome? Well, hold on, let me focus. Whoa, you can see my reflection. Should we get in a hole? What? Ah. What a tragedy. Greek mythology, man.